if you're new to watchmaking, understanding the effects of magnetism on your watch service is absolutely critical for performing a quality service. That's why one of the basic requirements before adjusting and regulation is that the movement must be 100% free of magnetism and not just 80 or 90% free. Well, today we're going to dive into magnetism, hopefully clearing up some of the confusion associated with it. And I'm going to show you the one thing that might be handicapping your watch service more than anything else. And we're going to start right now. When we talk about magnetism and its effect on a watch movement, they're not always going to be visually obvious to you. Now, you may have heard that if a movement is magnetized, the hairspring coils are going to stick together or stick to each other. Well, that's not always going to be the case, as you're going to see in a few minutes. So how exactly does magnetism affect the normal operation of a movement? Well, in extreme cases, it can cause the coils of the hairspring to stick together, effectively shortening the hairspring, which will cause faster rates. But what's far more common is that a smaller amount of magnetism is present, which is affecting the rate, but just to a lesser degree. This situation will cause a lesser experienced watchmaker to completely overlook the real issue affecting the rate and start troubleshooting in all the wrong places, often making things even worse. Now, to demonstrate magnetism's effect, I'm going to be using one of my test movements today, the ETA 2824. If you're not familiar with this concept of test movements, these are either new or at least well-running movements that you use to test different theories, ideas, concepts, or anything that you learn. Instead of using an older movement, you just use a test movement. Now, I'm going to begin with the movement at a full wind. And we're going to start by demagnetizing this movement, and we're also going to demagnetize the movement hole. I want to establish a benchmark by first getting a reading on the time grapher to see where the rate and the amplitude are. As you can see, the rate is fluctuating between three to five seconds per day, and the amplitude is currently at 231 degrees. Now, to magnetize the movement, I'm just going to use this magnet in this floor sweep, which has a pretty strong magnet in it. I mean, it's not super strong, but it'll be more than adequate for the testing that we're doing right now. So with the movement back on the time grapher, we can clearly see the results that the magnetism is having on the movement. The rate has increased to between 118 to 120 seconds per day. And you'll also notice that the amplitude is dropped to 178, which is about 53 degrees less than from where we started from. Another myth that lurks out there on the internet is that magnetism will show up on the time grapher as a snowy screen. Well, you can see we have a very magnetized movement, but we also have very straight trace lines. So snow on the screen has nothing directly to do with magnetism by itself. But if you have another fault like the clearance between two parts, the magnetism could make that problem worse, which can create disturbances to the trace lines. When we look at the effect of magnetism to this hairspring, you can clearly see that the hairspring coils are not sticking to each other. When I stop the balance wheel from spinning and take a closer look at it, I don't see any points along the hairspring which are stuck together. And just to make sure we're not missing anything here, I'm going to remove the balance wheel to check the area under the balance cock where we can't see it right now. So as we look at the hairspring from the underside, it should be obvious that there are no areas of the coils that are sticking together. So clearly, 
a movement can be highly magnetized enough to drop the amplitude 50 plus degrees as well as speed up the rate by 115 seconds per day with no visible signs to the hairspring itself. So now the question becomes, if magnetism is not shortening the hairspring by the coils being stuck together, what's going on here that's actually causing the amplitude to drop in the rate to increase? Normally, when we see rates go up like this, it's due to a shortened hairspring, uh, it's caused by oil contamination, or the coils not being concentric. Or it could even be cases of extreme magnetism, all of which are going to cause the hairspring to become shorter. Now, the way I would describe what we're seeing here is what I call magnetic friction. It's not friction in the sense of two parts rubbing together. It's more of a resistance or an interference of the magnetic field between the steel parts as they move past one another. Think about when you're holding two magnets together. That force that you feel as they're trying to connect to each other. This is the force that the escapement has to overcome. This is magnetic friction. If the movement doesn't have a non-magnetic hairspring, when the coils move in and out from each other, this magnetic friction makes it harder for the coils to expand and contract. This extra strain to the hairspring lowers the balance wheel's amplitude and increases the rate. The pallet fork and the pallet bridge are also made out of steel. When the pallet fork is trying to move away from the banking pin, there's added resistance, you know, almost as if the two parts are sticking to each other. This, of course, lowers the impulse to the escapement, which lowers the amplitude, increasing the rate. The balance jewel setting is steel, so when the guard pin moves back and forth across it, more power is required to overcome this resistance, which slows the balance amplitude, and increases the rate. If you're working on a vintage movement which has steel safety rollers, there's resistance between the end of the pallet fork and the roller, which lowers the balance wheel amplitude, increasing the rate. Now, when you start adding all these things together, and you'll, you'll start seeing rate increases like what I just showed you on our test movement. So, then what about magnetism actually slowing down a rate? I can tell you in 40 years, I've never seen or heard a convincing reason how this can actually happen. Now, a movement with a very slow rate could have some magnetism in it, but the fault that is actually causing the rate to be slow is just more powerful than whatever the effect the magnetism is having to the movement. Okay, so let's put the balance back onto the movement and look at a couple ways that we can detect magnetism. There are several ways this can be done. The first is when you're using steel tweezers and a screw sticks to it. I mean, it's pretty obvious at this point that something is magnetized. Another way is to use an app like Lespy, which is what I'm going to test to see how accurate this app really is. Now, once you get it set up, all you do is you find the sensor on your phone and you hold the movement right over the sensor. And if it detects magnetism, it'll say magnetism detected right on the screen. In this case, you can clearly see the app is picking up the magnetism. Now, another way to detect magnetism is with a compass. So with our movement on the bench, we just move the compass over it, and you can clearly see that the needle is reacting to the magnetism of the steel parts. So now I'm going to demag the movement again, and just for good measure, I'll demag the movement holder as well. I'm going to put the movement back on the time grapher and look at the readings again. Now let's check the app and the compass again. 
we start the app test by holding down the arrow button. You hold the movement over the sensor. And as you can see, the app is not reacting to the presence of any magnetism. But when we do the test again with the compass, there almost appears to be signs that the compass is reacting to something. But I can tell you that this movement is completely demagnetized. So I would say that of the two methods, the Lepsi app appears to be way more reliable. This is probably partly due to the fact that the needle of the compass is magnetized slightly. So I think it's merely reacting to the steel parts instead of actual magnetism in the movement. So clearly we can see the app works, but what about when the movement is magnetized to a lesser degree? I'm going to magnetize the movement again, but this time I'm holding it a little further away from the magnet to see if we can introduce a smaller amount of magnetism. Now with the movement back on the time grapher, we can see that the movement is showing the effects of a smaller amount of magnetism. The current rate of 56 to 58 seconds per day is roughly about half of what it was before. So let's see if the Lepsi app picks this smaller amount of magnetism up. Well, clearly it does. So I would say in general that the app is pretty reliable at this point. Now, with that said, can you rely on it to be able to pick up magnetism that might only affect the movement by 10 or 15 seconds per day. Well, I had to know, so I messed around with waving the movement over the magnet at different distances until I got a magnetism effect of about plus 20 seconds a day. And I checked it again, and the app picked it up. So I would say if used correctly, the Lepsi app is very reliable for detecting magnetism. And here lies the problem that may be confusing a lot of new watchmakers. If you're under the assumption that the presence of magnetism in a movement is only there when you can see the coil sticking together, or that magnetism is always going to create obviously high rates, then you're gonna run into problems with your regulation. When looking at a time grapher, decreased amplitude and rate increases of 10 to 20 seconds per day, magnetism can easily be overlooked as being some other issue related to the 20 or so other things that could cause low amplitude and higher rates. Now, there will be times where you may think you've done a great job because the time grapher is showing low amplitude, but your horizontal rates are zero seconds per day. When in reality, if there's any magnetism present, the movement is actually running at a negative 20 to 30 seconds per day. Now, I don't know how many times I've said this in my videos, but the second rule of adjusting and regulation is that the movement has to be 100% free of magnetism. And this is why demagging should be a standard part of your service work. Now, when I do my standard service, I start by demagging the movement before I even start working on it. You know, while I'm doing my preliminary inspections, I demag again before I actually clean the parts. I do this to prevent any metallic particles that may be left over in the cleaners in the rinse from being attracted to any parts that may be magnetized. And then I demag one last time after assembly before the movement runs through its 24 hour settling in period. Now, is that overkill? I don't really think so. When checking the current state of a movement before you start taking it apart, how can you be sure that any problems with how the escapement is running are not caused by magnetism? How important is it to not have metal particles 
on your nice clean parts after they come out of the cleaner. How important is it to know that no static electricity or magnetized tools have caused your freshly serviced movement to become magnetized. Now, there's tons of demagnetizers on the market, and you can spend silly money on one if you really want to. What's personally important to me in a demagnetizer is reliability and speed. I don't want there to be any doubt about whether a movement has any magnetism in it. And I certainly don't want to have to check it every time with an app or a compass. But that's just me. The Elma anti-mag unit that I use, I mean, they run about 260 bucks or so. And even though it may seem like a lot of money, for me, and as much as I use it, it's overall reliability and ease of use, from my perspective, it's worth the money. I use it not only to demag movements, but I use it to demag all my tools as well. Now, I understand a lot of people are either not in the position or have no desire to spend that much. So I wanted to take a look at the demagger that everyone seems to recommend that little blue box from China. So we're gonna start off by establishing our benchmark. In this case, we are starting off at about four to seven seconds per day. Then I'm gonna magnetize the movement again. And then we're gonna verify the magnetism is present on the time grapher. As you can clearly see on the time grapher, magnetism has increased the rate. Now, when using this style of demagger, how you use it is key. You simply lay the movement on the top, you press and hold the button down, and you should feel the movement start vibrating a little bit. And then you slowly draw the movement away until you get about two or th three feet away from it. The further, the better. As you can see, the demagnetizer worked in this particular test. So if you don't have a demagnetizer and you need one, this $10 demagnetizer along with the Lepsi app is a pretty good way to ensure that your movement is 100% free of magnetism. So I'll leave a link in the description of the one that I bought in case you need one. By making demagnetizing a higher priority in your service procedure, you can easily eliminate one of the possible causes of lower amplitude and higher rates, allowing you to focus any troubleshooting on other issues without magnetism muddying the water. Well, thanks for watching, guys. And because there's so much more to learn, I'll see you in the next video.